Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Beata Skiba, and I am a software engineer at Google in Warsaw in Poland. And I have spent my last one and a half years working on autoscaling in Kubernetes. And I have worked on multiple parts of autoscaling, uh, and main, mainly cluster autoscaling and also horizontal pod autoscaling. But currently, I've shifted my focus uh, to bring another dimension of autoscaling to the Kubernetes world, namely vertical pod autoscaling. And this is what I would like to talk to you about today. Um, and in this talk, you will learn how vertical pod autoscaler can take the burden of choosing just the right size for your pods. So in Kubernetes, the size of the pod is expressed as a resource request. So let's first take a look at what it means and how it impacts your applications. Uh, you have probably all seen something like this. Uh, this is a simple deployment. Actually, it's a part of a simple deployment, but for the sake of simpli simplification. So that shouldn't be too hard, right? You just want to deploy a simple thing to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I would like to focus specifically on the part that is shown at the bottom, so the resource request part. Uh, here we say that deployment needs 100 megabytes of memory and 250 milli CPUs. Okay, that's fantastic, but how do we know that? So the reality looks more often like this. We don't know. We, we have no idea how much resources our applications will actually need. But why is that even important? Why is the fact that we often don't know how to see, set those resource requests harmful for our uh, applications? So to start with, uh, the resource request is actually a contract. It's a contract between your workload and the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, the resources that you request are guaranteed to be reserved for your workload, uh, provided that they are available in the cluster. So this means, for example, that if you request a certain amount of CPU or memory, uh, Kubernetes scheduler promises never to put your workloads on a node that can't support that, that doesn't have that resources available. So on the other side of this bargain, if there is no such place for your workload currently available in the cluster, the scheduler will not schedule your pod anywhere. So a short disclaimer, this is not entirely true because now we have priority and preemption in Kubernetes, but Assuming all your pods have the same priority at the moment, this is what will happen. So uh, we know now that resource request is a contract, but that's a big word, and what does it really mean in practice? So we'll analyze two example situations uh, to see how resource request impacts the situation of your workloads in your cluster. So this is the first one. And we have two nodes in the cluster. They are both free and they have 900 milli CPUs available space. And we have two pods just waiting to be scheduled. One is requesting 200 milli CPUs, another 600 milli CPUs. Okay, this one is easy, right? One pod goes, goes into one node, another pod goes into another node. But now, imagine that we have mistakenly set the resource request of the first pod, the red one. So we said it actually needs 200 mini CPUs, but it, it actually uses 500 mini CPUs. So at the moment, it all, it's, it's all okay, right? There is uh, spare uh, capacity on the node where you're scheduled. And uh, Kubernetes, so specifically kubelet, will give you those spare resources because it makes no sense to, to have that CPU sitting idle. But now, we have another pod. There's another pod, it requests 600 mini CPUs, and it's a good citizen. It actually uses the exact amount of resources that it requests. Of course, that never happens, but let's assume. Uh, and according to your contract with the scheduler, you only need 200 mini CPUs, and that's what's guaranteed for you. So what scheduler will do, it will go ahead and schedule the pod in that free space. So now we have this situation. Your workload is unhappy. It doesn't have this free space that it previously depended on. So, um, well, it's actually not going to, also it's not going to get better with time because uh, the scheduler only use, uh, looks at the resource request, so it doesn't actually know that your workload is unhappy. So now we'll take a look at another example. And this one also uh, includes cluster autoscaler. 
to see how it also depends on your resource request set co correctly. So this is, situation is similar, but the first part is a bit bigger. So it requests almost a whole node. Uh, 800 mini CPUs, the other one is the same as before. So far, so good. Scheduling is easy. One part goes on one node, another on the second one. But what if the situation is reversed from what we had in the first place? What if we said that we need more than we're actually using? At this moment, this is not such a big deal because, well, those resources would sit idle anyway, right? We're, we're not harming anyone else in this cluster. But again, we have a new pod. And what happens now is scheduler again takes a look at all the contracts that it has and it sees that there is no space to schedule the new pod because otherwise it would have to violate one of the contracts that it has. So basically your pod is pending and it stays pending. So this is not good. You have a workload that you want to run and it's not running even though the resources are there. Like, in theory, they are there. Uh, so things get a tad better if you have cluster autoscaler configured in your cluster. Uh, because the pending pod, the permanently pending pod is just a signal that cluster autoscaler waits for in order to trigger a scale up. So it sees your pod, it sees that it's in a pending state. It kicks in and it adds a new machine for you. Okay, so that's a little bit better, right? Because the scheduler notices the new node, schedules the pod, and now everyone is happy, right? Well, maybe all your, workloads, all your workloads run, that's good. They have enough resources. They actually have more than enough resources. But if the resource requests were set correctly in the first place, we wouldn't need that third node. So we're actually using more resources than we need. So summing up, there is danger in both too small and too big boxes for your workloads. If your requests are too low, as we've seen, the scheduler will pack your nodes tightly. Uh, then the pods don't have enough resources to run and this resu results in several unhappy endings. Uh, you can have out of memory er errors or workloads evicted due to memory pressure and these both cause disruption to your workloads. They cause your, your pods to be evicted and rescheduled on, they can also become pending. Uh, if you have uh, CPU starvation, then your workloads will be underperforming because they actually need more CPU than they're given. Um, and what is more, this will be the worst when you need it the most. Because when your cluster is under high load and you need it to perform, you need your work workloads to perform on their best, they will actually be throttled and they can actually become uh, evicted because of not enough memory. So uh, lastly, as I mentioned before, this will not get better over time. Nobody use, looks at the actual usage of your applications, only at the requests. So until you come and change them yourself, you're in the unhappy state. So, uh, it end, what is more, this will not get better even if you have cluster autoscaler configured because as we've seen, it depends on uh, seeing a pending pod that has no space to run, but it, this in turn depends on the scheduler to see that this pod should be pending, which in turn again depends on correct, correctly set resource requests. On the other hand, if we specify too high resource requests, then this may cause us to waste resources. Uh, if we overshoot them, the scheduler will spread the pods on more nodes than we actually need, and the cluster to scaler will, will kick in earlier because it will see pending pods that don't have space to schedule in your cluster. So that's not a pretty picture that we've painted. What can we do about it? How can we uh, set resource requests right? There's a couple ways that you can do. You can try out your applications by creating canary deployments. You can try simulating production load and then set requests for your production workloads based on that. 
You can also go with a trial and error, sort of a trial and error procedure. You deploy your workloads with some requests. Then you see if they're happy, they are happy, you look at their actual usage. Do they need more, do they need less? Uh, and you sort of figure it out on the way. You can also just try to guess. And it's actually a bit frightening, and, but sort of understandable looking at how hard it is. There's a lot of people doing it this way. It's hard. Setting resource requests is hard. So all of those methods have downsides. And testing and carrying, they require additional resources, right? They require, require time, effort. They require additional computational resources. What is more, your results will, well, they may, and they most probably will, differ from what you later see in production. And the last one, the last one is the, like, the, the most um, infuriating one. Because even if you tailor your research requests perfectly for, for this moment. Uh, actually, the resource needs of your applications will change over time, just because the load is changing, the traffic is shifting. So let me present the hero in all this unhappiness. It's vertical product to scalar. Uh, and it essentially does three main things. It does the thing that I said Kubernetes scheduler never does. It goes ahead and looks at the actual usage of your applications while they run. Uh, then, based on these observations, it uh, makes recommendations for what your workloads should actually be using. And then, if you configure it to do so, it will update the resource requests of your running workloads. And that last part is experimental and I will comment more on why that is a little bit later. Uh, all the information about vertical scaling is contained in a VPA object. Uh, it's defined as a custom resource, it's a custom resource definition, and it is divided as most Kubernetes objects into spec and status. So uh, the spec controls what and how should be scaled, and the status is where the recommendations are actually provided. So since VPA object is the central point of everything we're talking about onwards, let's take a closer look at what it contains and what, it le what does it let us do. So VPA spec is the way for you to provide the information on what and how you want to scale. So this is an example spec that vertically scales a worker deployment. Now, where do I know that from? So the selector, is the what to scale part. And this is expressed as a regular Kubernetes label selector. And this gives us quite a bit of flexibility because this example shows how to auto scale a single deployment, but you can actually say that only part of your deployment should be vertically scaled. Or I have these two deployments and they're actually pretty similar. Please scale them together for me. The how to scale part consists of update policy and resource policy. The update policy lets you control the actuation part. So how are the recommendations applied to your workloads? Uh, and there are three update modes available currently. The first is off and it's sort of a dry run. It lets you get the feel of how VPA works for you because it provides the recommendations but it will never, never actually modify your pod requests. You can, as I said, you can use it to try it out, but you can also use it for uh, manual actuation, sort of. So you use VPA to let you know what sort of, uh, sort of recommendation, see what sort of recommendation it spits out, and then take it and update your deployment to request the, the, the amount that was uh, recommended. The second mode is an initial, and this will, only change pods uh, requests during creation, but it will never forcefully restart your pods to change their requests. So this will tap into any pod creations that are caused by something else than VPA system. So uh, evictions caused by other systems, adding new pods to deployment, so scaling it horizontally, uh, then uh, rolling updates, 
But if your workloads are very stable, you're not adding pods, they're not crashing and restarting, then it will not apply your, the recommendations to the running pods. And the last one is auto, and this is a full thing. So this uh, will take a look on the pods running in your cluster and restart them once their requests are too far off from the recommended resources. And you can also control the scaling of containers inside the pods uh, that are controlled by, by your VPA uh, by specifying per container policies. So this specific policies, uh, policy uh, says that your container, your containers, and it says all containers, this, this is the asterisk special container name, uh, they will never get more than five gigs of memory recommended. Uh, and, uh, but this can be done per container, and it can also, like, you can um, specify maximum, minimum resources, and this goes both for memory and for CPU, uh, and you can also turn off scaling for a specific container inside the pod. And this is useful if you, for example, have a sidecar container that you know always does the constant, constant amount of work and would, will not actually need scaling. This is the status, it's the output of vertical pod autoscaler. Uh, this is where recommendations are provided and the recommendations are provided on a container le level. So we recommend resources for all the containers uh, that were configured to be vertically scaled. Uh, the recommendations contains three things. It contains the target value, uh, a lo lower and upper bound. Um, so the target is, it's highlighted because it's the most important thing. Uh, and this is the actual recommendation. This is what we currently think that your workload should be using at the moment. The lower and upper bound are sort of indicators of confidence of our recommendation. What they, what they actually say is anything below lower bound is known to be not enough for the workload and anything uh, above upper bound we know is wasteful. And the bounds get closer to the target the more usage samples we collect. So the more confident we are that the, that the recommendation that we're providing is based on a lot of data so it's more, we, we have more confidence that it's right. So, this finishes the part that you need to know as the user. And now, for those interested how this all looks under the hood, let's take a look at how VPA provides, actually provides recommendations for you. So this is a slide I'm not very proud of because there's a lot of things in it, but uh, what I would like uh, to um, focus on is that VPA is actually divided into three independent parts and these are actually three independent binaries. And they all interact only through the VPA object, never directly. So we have VPA recommender, and this is the, like the brain. This is the thing that provides recommendations for you. We have a VPA admission plugin that plugs into the pod creation process in Kubernetes to actually update the resource requests of your pods when needed. And the third part is a VPA updater and this watches the running pods and restarts those that have their request too far away from recommendation, again, if this is configured to, to be done so. So the fact that these three are separate and uh, that they only communicate via VPA object is important from extensibility and pluggability part. Because if you have, it's, it's very easy to provide an environment specific recommender it will calculate the, com the, the recommendations completely differently, and this whole thing still works. You can also switch out updater if you want, and this whole thing still works. So let's take a look at all those arrows and boxes that were there in, in, in more detail. So first I wanna talk about VPA recommender. So this is the part, it's the most important part. It watches what's happening with your pods, the pods that you configure to be vertically scaled and it gets actual resource usage from metric server, and it also gets uh, events that are connected with uh, memory usage, so out of memory events and evictions due to memory pressure. And uh, it takes a look at VPA spec to see which pods it should actually calcula calculate recommendations for, 
And based on the observations, it provides the recommendation. So what's the math behind this, you know, waving of a hand and the magic? Uh, BPA in Kubernetes currently uses a recommendation model that has been used successfully in Google Borg infrastructure. Uh, it collects usage samples history in a histogram, and they then takes uh, a very high percentile of that as target recommendation. Uh, it currently does this for the last eight days. Uh, so the history is accumulated for the last eight days if it's, if it's available. And the, it's important to note that um, this is not part of the API. As I said before, the, the recommender is pluggable. This is, this is uh, the way the recommendations are provided is not part of the API and it's not guaranteed to always be the same. So if we find a better algorithm, if we find that it's not suitable to some workloads, we may and we probably will change it in the future. So now we have our recommendation ready. Now we would like to make use of it. So when a pod is created, it goes through, uh, in Kubernetes, it goes through a series of admission plugins. And one of those is a mutating webhook admission plugin, which, which uh, can be configured to call external webhooks uh, to do some things to the pod that is currently being created. And one of those plugins is a VPA admission plugin. And what it does, it's, it's aware of all the active vertical pod autoscaling objects in the cluster. It sees the pod that is currently being created. It's, it, watch, it, it takes a look at the VPA objects and verifies if this, this pod uh, actually matches one of those. And if you have configured your pod to be actually actuated upon, so the initial and outer mode that I said, that I talked about before, it will modify the resource request to the target of the recommendation. And the last part, the experimental part, is actually updating pods, running pods during their lifetime. So this is experimental and there's several reasons for that. Uh, firstly, in Kubernetes, the pod spec is immutable. So what this means, it's actually impossible in the Kubernetes system to change resource requests in place. You cannot modify resource requests of a pod during its lifetime. So what you have to do is you have to evict the pod and let it be recreated and only then you can assign the correct resource requests. So this will cause actual disruption to your workloads. And uh, there's a second reason. Uh, currently VPA is not aware, it's not very aware of the infrastructure that you're running in a way that it can recommend pod sizes that don't fit your cluster. For example, too big for all your nodes. Uh, when it happens, it will stop updating your pods but still this will cause, this can may cause actual disruption. So the way this works, now, now we have this disclaimer of experimental out of the way, the way is th this works is updater uh, constantly analyzes the list of pods and when it notices that there is a pod that is too much out of sync with the recommendation uh, and this translates actually to if the request is outside of the lower and upper bound that we talked about before, uh, this means that it needs to be updated. So the updater goes ahead and evicts the pod, and this goes through the Kubernetes eviction API, so it will observe any pod disruption budgets that you have. Uh, and then it depends on a controller, so the pod has to be created by a replica set or stateful set or what, whatnot. Uh, so we rely on the controller to recreate the pod and then go through all those admission plugins again and get correct resource requests assigned. All right, so let's see where we currently are and what's planned for the project. So we had an alpha release in April and we got uh, feedback from community early adopters for which we are extremely thankful for. It helped us a lot to iterate, to fix some bugs, fix some things, to verify that the API that we have actually enables people to express the things that they want. Uh, and again, again, we're very, very gr grateful. 
And the, we have come up with the beta quality product, and this is being be in the process of being graduated at the moment. So like literally, I mean, we're just about to open a final PR with updates to documentation and we're ready to go. So I expect if when you come back from this KubeCon, you will find it that it is indeed in beta. Uh, and then what are the plans? What we believe is we're still missing the most uh, are two key areas. And the first one is setting application limits. Because as maybe some of you noticed, through the whole of the talk, I've been talking about request this, request that, but there's also limits. And limits are actually important, especially for memory, for your workload stability and predictability. And we recognize that. And we're working on incorporating this into vertical pod autoscaler as well. And secondly, I've been talking about the fact that pod spec is immutable but there's actually an effort in the Kubernetes community to change that and to make it possible to update resource requests on the fly. So if that happens and uh, we will we'll be able to take advantage of that and to also be able to do non-disruptive updates to your workloads whenever that's possible. Because imagine you just want to shrink your pod. It's not going to use more requests. It's still going to fit on the node why we started, right? So uh, there is, like, we recognize, however, that this effort will require a significant amount of work. It touches a lot of things at the core of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, the way scheduler works, the way kubelet works, and also this has been an ingrained assumption in Kubernetes for a long time. Like everybody expects these things to, to just stay immutable. So uh, we are watching this, we're trying to help with the, with the uh, community uh, movement to, to make those resource requests mutable and also make the, this work actually for, for VPA so that we can take use of it to provide not, don't, not, uh, don't, not disruptive uh, updates. I'm not sure that's very visible, but uh, we're actually part of SIG autoscaling uh, you can find us at the Kubernetes Autoscaler repo on GitHub. Uh, please go check it out, check VPA out, let us know how it works for you. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you very much. So if there's any questions, yes. Uh, yes, so the question was, are VPAs namespace specific? And the answer is yes. The VPA is a namespace, it's a namespace DRD. So, will the updater evict pods gradually? So the question was, will the, evict, uh, will the updater evict pods gradually? Uh, it's very much depends on your, so it uses the eviction API. So if you have a pod disruption budget that only says you, you can only have one pod down, then uh, it will just update one by one. It also has some internal uh, rate limiting. So we have, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's probably something like not more than 10% 10, 10 uh, of your workload can be down uh, at one go. But you can control it very well. You should be able to control it very well by uh, setting very restrictive pod disruption budgets. Yes? So what if it's going into a deployment and it's just a new version of your architecture and it's just a teeny small number? Yeah. Does it still keep using the same uh, like history or does it like port it to the right mm -hmm. and use the same memory requirements and just take it out? So the question was if you have a new version of your deployment and it's actually different because it's a new version and has different memory needs, it actually needs more memory, will the same history be used? So the answer at the moment is yes, the same history be, will be used. Uh, so we're in early stages and we will be looking at how uh, we can also be smarter with the um, deployment life cycle, right? We, we can be more, uh, we're not looking at this actively at the moment, but we are aware that this may be a problem. We'll, we'll be looking at the, at the feedback. Yeah. 
So the question was, it integrates with metric server, but does it also have a way to plug in uh, other metrics, metric providers, or does it work with other metric providers? Um, I believe we have some integration with Prometheus. I'm not sure how well that works. Actually, we don't have it, we definitely don't have it extensively tested, uh, but there uh, is a way to provide a different, to have a different metrics provider in the system. Uh, Oh, yes, yes, that's, uh, so the question was, can you explain how this works with HPA? So at the moment, uh, the answer is with CPU and memory, it doesn't, unfortunately. So um, they will race each other. They, they're not aware of each other, so they will race each other with, uh, it's, it's actually, we, we haven't tested this like, extensively, but m the intuition is it won't work very, very well on the same metric. But uh, what you can do is HPA now supports custom metrics and external metrics. And we actually have people successfully using VPA with HPA configured on uh, custom metrics. So this is, this is one way to, to solve it. So the question, is there a way to make it aware, to make it be aware of the, all of the sources and if it scales horizontally to uh, up, scale it down vertically? Um, I guess we probably will be looking at how these two work together. Um, we haven't done it, looked into it yet. Uh, the question is, do we, ha do we have uh, plans to support ex extended resources uh, on the roadmap? Currently not, but probably if we see that this is something that the community needs, we will take a look. Sorry, I see a lot of questions here. So the question is, if there's no CPU requests uh, or memory requests specified for the deployment, will it still work? Yes, it will still work. We don't depend on the requests, initial requests to, uh, to work. Uh, we will just look at your usage. The only problem is if you actually, so if you have no re resource requests set at the beginning, uh, if you don't use the auto mode, uh, if you just deploy your deployment, it takes some time for VPA to generate the recommendation. If the pods are already running and they're not uh, you know, being restarted for whatever other reason, if you don't have automatic updates in VPA, they will just run without the requests. But if you have auto mode on or if something happens to your application or you have new pods coming, then this, they will get the new recommended resources. Uh, I think I've seen here a question for some time. Uh, so for the eviction process, can it uh, handle custom shutdown? Uh, so custom, by custom shutdown, do you mean, I don't know, like you have graceful termination, yeah. stuff like that? So it's still kind of like a basic yeah, so I think this is handled by the eviction API. Cool. What on, the only thing we do, we ask, kindly ask Kubernetes to evict the pod for us, and however long it takes, it will, it will accept that. So we're, we were actually thinking of limiting the graceful termination period because if you have a very long graceful ter termination period that will make your VPA very, very slow in updating your pods. But at the moment, this is your choice. If your pod have, have very uh, long graceful termination period, we will definitely observe that. Don't need to send a business 
So uh, two questions. First was how long does it take for the lower and upper bound to actually cause pot evictions? And uh, so let me first answer that. So this is heavily dependent on how your workload is, depend the, is um, we're, uh, behaving. Uh, I can, if you come later, I can show you specifically what, how it's done. But I think basically it is conservative. So at the moment, I think after 12 hours, you need to be, um, if you're overshooting, you need to overshoot by, I think, at least three times, something like that. And then it goes down. After a day, it goes much closer. So once you have actually accumulated full history, it can react very fast. It will also react faster if you have actual out of memory errors. So it will see that and will actually bump it up very much. Uh, so, but it's very, it's very workload specific. So it, there's no like, you know, after this time the update will happen. Uh, as I said, I can come and then I can show you the actual piece of the code that the, the, the comments in, in, in the code that describe how it's done. And there is the second question. Uh, the, domino the domino effect. So um, is it, so whenever one pod start, needs updating, uh, probably the other, and it gets killed, the other pods will get more load, and then they need to be killed too because they start, like, they're even worse. Uh, so, the way this works, the recommendation is provided um, for the whole workload, so all of your pods. So, at the moment, we decide we need to update your pods, we decide we, up, we need to update all your pods. If in the meantime your pod gets shut down, the recommendation may vary slightly because of the domino, domino effect that you mentioned, uh, but I will actually have to see it in the wild to, 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 to see that this actually causes domino effect because I think Yeah, I think we can we can talk about after this session. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I can see another question. Can you can you uh, can you come a little closer because I'm sorry I can't hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the suggestion was only update uh, on surface uh, upgrade, and I think this is this is handled. If I understand collect correctly, what you mean, this is handled by the initial mode. <coughs> so this is this takes this never forcefully automatically restarts your pods. It will only apply the recommendations if, for some other reason, for example, an upgrade, your pods are being recreated and we see them created. So I think this is this is what covers this use case, and it should be it should be useful. Okay. So the question was: Is there any overhead running this permanently, as opposed to just uh, learning, and learning and then using that? 
So this is actually running in your cluster. If you deploy it, it's, it's actually adding some load to your cluster because this is free, uh, free binaries, free additional binaries running in your cluster. Uh, it will also cause some additional load on your API server because it needs to fetch all the, fetch all the data in the metric server or another metric provider. Uh, so there's an overhead. Uh, if, your, if your workloads are very stable, then I guess uh, just, just generating this and using it later is fine. But if your workloads will change over time, which I think is true for most of them, uh, then I'd suggest just run it. So I only heard the first part. The first part was, is there a lower, like a uh, hard, low, uh, lower bound? So the answer is yes. Uh, and I don't remember this, I think it's, I don't remember the specific numbers because we changed it, uh, but I can go and check it. But there is actually, we, we, there is a lower bound under which we don't recommend resources. So this, so the question is, is it limit range aware? Uh, limit, uh, so the answer is, I think limit range also works as an admission plugin, am I correct? So it's sort of, um, with admission plugin, like PPA is also an admission plugin. So this, um, this depends on how, on the, on the order. So I think, I'm not sure how this works with the webhook plugins because it's possible that the webhook admission plugin runs at the very end and then this will not work. I, will have to ch I would have to check how it's configured, but. Okay, any last questions? Oh, yeah. So, can you, so I heard what happens if you have a spike at the beginning and your app is not CPU bound? I think, I think I'm running out of time. I didn't get, get all this, but if you can come and, and we, I guess we can discuss uh, offline. Okay, thank you very much.